Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so I'm Philip, um, Captain at After Now. Uh, today I'm going to try to do something uh, different. I've put all the videos there, uh, so I'm not going to play them in the in the things. You can play them at your pace um, as I'm talking through it, uh, because some are pretty long, and I want to get through a lot very fast. Um, so. What I want to talk about today is some practical use case we came up with uh, and give us some new processes to be able to blend the virtual and the real world, how in our design we were able to do it. Um, so before I dig deeper into that, I wanted to check a little bit in the audience. Who is, uh, who is considering himself a designer in the audience? Oh, wow. Who uh, considers himself a developer? OK. Uh, who spend most of his time working on user experience? Perfect. And uh, who has built an AR applications already or been involved in building one? Okay, so I can go fast on the first few slides. I have a very expert audience. Um, so you guys know the problem and understand. And what I'm going to focus here is uh, not too much on that because we know that something is happening and there's a big convergence of those technology. Uh, what I want to say there is that it's not just the AR glasses that's going to make that uh, new experience happening. It's also the AI and the Internet of Things. And those blend of everything is going to make all that user-human interactions change completely. Um, this is kind of our vision of things and our steps and where we are. At. We're pretty much today in that guy sitting down for most people. Us in the room here, we're in transition between the VR and the AR world. We're already into that space, getting there and actually building it. Um, and um, I want to show this picture, not about the military part of side of this, but more about the guy standing up. And in movies, uh, you see a lot of those uh, interfaces have been built, and the person is standing up and using the full space. Like they're moving, they're using the hands, they're turning, they have their gestures, and they use full, uh, full space uh, of their interactions, and now they interact with their virtual uh, space. Um, so. A lot of our work and most of our work was done with um, six degree of freedom headset. So we didn't work much with uh, simple uh, gyroscope headsets or things like that. What we're really interested in is when there's a real blend between the two worlds and when we can move around in our world and the headsets match the two. So all the use cases you're going to see and I'm going to talk about relate to those type of device. Uh, so we work mainly with HoloLens, Tango, and uh, the Vive. But we are also um, now looking into the new glasses from, uh, from Dacry and the R8 from ODG because they now have six degree of freedom uh, capabilities that works really well at a reasonable price. Um, so I'm going to start with our envisioning and design process. Um, uh, most of you probably know those process and been through it because they relate to how we were doing it before. Uh, for building UI, uh, but I want to go there because there is something uh, to say about the fact that we work on papers and ideas a lot before we even touch, touch anything related to a device. Um, so we have the first time is we have a very selected of participant. We have all type of participant in there, uh, so we can have a very eclectic crew and have feedback from everyone in the team. Um, the first part is mainly setting up the constraint, defining the problem, identifying the goals of where we're going. Then the second day is uh, doing ideations, uh, finding ideas for those problems, and solving uh, and creating solutions for the problem we stated on the previous day. And the last, uh, the third day, sorry, it's not the last. Third day is to decide from all the solutions we've came up with which one we're going to work on next. And that's where it gets interesting is on the fourth day, we're prototyping. And that's where I'm going to extend a little bit on that. For us, prototyping is very important. And we do that uh, with paper prototype. And then we gradually move to more and more interactive prototypes. Um, so on that fourth day, usually we do a very simple paper prototype. And then on the fifth day, we test it with users. And if it doesn't work, we go back one step or two step in that process until we can iterate and we get something where we want to move forward with. Um, so in the UX process with prototyping, the um, first thing we do is paper prototype. So uh, basically, we um, so that's the first video. I don't know if you can see the URL up there. I hope so. But in the video, they're in the list of it. So that's the first video. And here, in that video, where we are um, actually just testing and acting out. So. 
as we were doing before on UI and 2D UI, we were doing paper prototype on piece of paper and showing it to the users. Now we cannot do that. We take full advantage of the space. So we place objects and we make up objects with cardboard, foam, uh, paper clips, and little piece of papers and little signs. And we have people and users acting around. So we act out our prototype and we act out our ideas. So we really have to play the experience to really feel and understand it. So we play by moving around, play by doing the space and where we're going into space, and as well as um, the interaction that goes with it. So if you go into the interactions and you have the users, they're holding up a panel, the users simulate a click, and we move to that. The value of this is that when uh, you theorize on a new work, for example, a lot of us start with storyboards. But on storyboard, you're still in 2D. By acting out, you can really feel what's working and not working. Is the distance too far? Is the gesture working? Is the object going to work in the field of view? Um, that doesn't make sense. Everything is happening in my back when things should be in the front. So you can really assess and solve a lot of those problems really early uh, by doing those acting out paper prototypes. Um, then, when you get to a point is that you have really a lot of limits with paper. You know, there's things you can't do. So at one point you get to want to do more defined and gradual interfaces. So what you do is you create uh, those interfaces in Tilbrush. We're still working only with designers. So the best way is to send them into Tilbrush. They create a really nice UI in it. And we take that UI and we integrate it. So if nobody knows Tilbrush, there's a great video that explains what it is. And uh, we, from the idea action of it, uh, we create it in Tilbrush and then we put it again either in Tilbrush or in the HoloLens for the users to actually start uh, testing and getting feedback early on. So then we get much more intricate UI that works much better for um, getting a sense of what that works. Um, so that's an example also of one of those fully done UI in, um, in Tilbrush. And we're testing, uh, that was a board where we're testing the interactions where the user fits, where the message would be left, and things like that. Um, next, next step, we get more interactive with Tilbrush, and we add to Unity. So we create different uh, design with Tilbrush, and then we animate it and chain them in Unity, and with simple either air tap or voice commands. So there could be an interaction between all those, uh, enter, um, all those um, uh, sorry, an interaction between all the flow of that user experience. So we take the user experience at each iteration, and each time we make progress from the user feedback, and we're answering all those questions, we're making the experience a little bit more complex so we can get to a point where uh, we get to a full uh, mix. So we're still using a lot of the paper and we're using the space, but now the users wear the HoloLens, and with the HoloLens, you can see all those tilt brush uh, assets we created for the user interface around them and they can interact with them and can go in with that. And at this point, we made a lot of progress. We know a lot about what's working and not working in our UI and not to make it useful without really much coding. Um, and that's very valuable. But then you get to another point is where Tilbrush is very nice to do something really fast and I would say crude. But when you want to refine your UI, the tools like Sketch or Photoshop are much better than that. You can really refine and make like the buttons and the icons and the shapes and the colors really well done and designers know really well to work with, um, with Photoshop or Sketch. So what we do at this point, we have another tool that works in the HoloLens and you drop all your 2D files into it uh, and we have a video also that demos how it works, but you drop your 2D files into that um, uh, that bucket on the folder somewhere and they load up in the HoloLens and then you place them in a 3D, f you know, in 3D space in a way that makes sense for that UI. So basically you use, let, use those 2D UI like texture and at that point you can get a sense of that really refined UI in space with the HoloLens to exactly put the users into it and interact with it. So then we add one, that adds us a one more layer of like refinement and granularity in our UI for the testing and the prototyping. So we can get to a much refined and interactive prototype with still only uh, using a designer team and get them, the developers uh, and uh, advanced like modeling really, uh, um, I will say, not too much involved at this point. So that process, uh, I'm gonna skip that. Yeah, actually, let me go back. If you guys want to see uh, an idea of how it looked like at the end, that was an early prototype. Um, and um, the next step, 
Yes, so I want to talk about that a little bit because that was different. So what you've seen before was more like an enterprise applications for collaboration that we built. So the user set is well defined, we know what we want, we know our objective, and at that point um, it's kind of controlled and it, there's every action as a productivity gain for us. So it was much more controlled, but when we and, um, and it worked really well. Um, but when we started working on that project, the Easter egg hunt, uh, and it was more about building a story and getting the users amazed and into a flow of you know, captivating their uh, attentions and getting to follow a story and get happy and joyful about it. Uh, so to make that work, we had to add to our process a little bit more work. Um, we had to actually code user test. So at that point, we had a team. And in our team, we picked one developer. And that developer was spending his days just coding tests. Uh, uh, so we coded the test very simply. We used just you know, very simple um, uh, assets from the asset stores. We defined very simple path. But our goal was to be able to test different stories for people to go through and see where were the arc and where were the benefits and where people finding the surprise, where was the, um, was the plot working for them and everything that would make the experience work. So we tested and coded all those different ones and get users into it. Now, I think a video here, so yeah, that's another video if you want to look later, uh, that will show uh, you some of those users going through those tests. And it's very simple. We just grab users at a meetup, put them the all and says, go through it, and we see what they're doing. We have our questions, and we see if it works. So we test all those scenarios, and we have somebody programming the scenarios. But we stay very simple. We don't think too much about the look at at this point. We just look at how the user and the flow into the experience, and if they're seeing what we want to see. Because when we're doing those experiences, what we want to make sure is that people are looking where we want them to look at. And are they doing what we want them to do at the right time? And getting that sequence of things happening exactly as we expect them to happen. So at that point, we just need sequencing and timing and movement of elements and animations, but we don't need it to be really refined. Um, so that's how we got to uh, make something that works. That's another product. Uh, it comes from the design team at uh, Microsoft. Uh, we tried to use it. It didn't work really well for us yet. I think it's really early. But that's where I think the things are going into those type of tools. Instead of building your own tools, you should uh, be able to uh, have, your, um, have a set of tools that will help you actually create those UI inside uh, and test them inside uh, virtual reality and augmented reality. So all the sketch is a tool you find in the HoloLens. Um, so the key points I, want you, I would love you guys to uh, get out of this is one of it is act out your experience. This is extremely valuable. We learned that from Microsoft. If you act it out and you play your experience in the space, in the room, you learn so much and you avoid so much mistakes in, and you can iterate so much faster in your design. Uh, the other one, just don't hesitate to find ways to do low-tech prototypes and get user to it. And uh, the, the pace we were going on on our different projects, about two user tests per week. And that's really fast when you think about it, because we have to prepare the test, code the test, get user through the test, learn about the test, and then do that again. Uh, but with doing that rhythm extremely fast, we learn much faster. There's no, we're in a space where nothing has been done yet. There's no blueprints. And you can just guess. If you guess, you'll get it. Re unlikely you get it right the first time. You may get it a little bit right, but without a user test, you may just miss something that's important. So we have to get everything to user testing, and that's why we're doing those all really, really fast. But yeah, and don't hesitate to cut your experience. OK, I'm done. Yeah. One more thing. <laughs> Sorry about that. I forgot. I think it's important. I just was thinking about that when I see the guy just before showing the switch on another talk, and I was really impressed by it. But when you think about it, 120 years ago, there was no switch. Before electricity, our world didn't have switch. It's really new that we have buttons in our world. And when we create all our UIs with the 2D and the phones, we're using buttons everywhere. And my prediction is that when we do all our design, we're trying to design them without buttons, without menus. And I think that where we're going in a few years with all those devices, buttons are going to disappear again. <laughs>